now. Thank you everybody for joining us today for this webinar. Uh, we're super excited that you're here and glad that you've taken the time out of your day to uh, tune in um, and engage with us. My name is Caleb Kelly. I'm the executive director of the Startup Junkie Foundation. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Startup Junkie, we're a mission-driven organization based here in Northwest Arkansas in the United States. Um, and we exist to support, inspire, and educate entrepreneurs and in innovators. And we do that by providing uh, no-cost consulting, one-on-one uh, -on -one consulting events, just like this one, workshops, programs. Um, and we do that, like I said, at absolutely no cost uh, to entrepreneurs anywhere from idea stage up to $25 million in revenue. Um, so whether you have an idea written on the back of a napkin or a thriving small business, uh, we're here to help you and however we can. Today, we're excited to have Permjot with us. He's an economist by background, He's the founder and CEO of Mentor Camp, co-founder of Flight and Partners, uh, the executive director of Inno Innova Corp. Mentor Connect, and this might be an old, old bio, Permjot. You can stop me because I know I've had this one. That's enough. That's enough. That's enough. We'll all right, I'll turn it over to you. That's enough. That's all good. I'm a friend of Arkansas. I'm actually, the thing I'm most proud of is I'm the Goodwill Ambassador for the state of Arkansas. Now, as you can tell from my accent, I am actually not from uh, Bentonville. I'm from Rogers. But boom, see, Jessica, that joke works in the United States as well. It's not, see, I know my, I know my Arkansas. I've missed Arkansas terribly. I've not been there for two years. Normally I'm there every three or four times a year and I miss Arkansas terribly. Those of you who are lucky enough to work with me in Arkansas, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for always making me feel so uh, welcome. Brett, if I'm in a bad mood, ladies and gentlemen, it's because of Brett Amorine. Uh, 10 minutes ago, Brett Amorine sends me an email telling me I owe him some money. Thanks a lot, Brett. Thanks a lot. How Sorry to kick about that. Workshop. Yeah, how to kick up a workshop. Hey, you owe me some money, dude. Thank you. And you blamed Biden. You blamed Biden in the email address. Biden has changed the tax rules. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brett. Uh, we didn't blame anybody. We, we, we assigned responsibility for the fee that you'll have to pay. That's I all. love that. I love that. We don't blame. We assign responsibility. Great. Jessica, exactly. you got that? We no longer blame. We assign responsibility. I love that. So welcome, everybody. First things first, I'm speaking to you from this wonderful place called Dartmouth in Nova Scotia. Uh, one of the things I always like doing is just acknowledging that I am the ancestral and unceded lands of the Mi'kmaq people. Here in Dartmouth, we are people of the treaty. May we all continue to live together in harmony and peace because uh, we enjoy these beautiful lands. So thank you very much. Today, we're going to be talking about strategy for startups. Strategy for startups. And now I am English, so I don't pronounce my T's. So I'm going to, we call it strategy. But I will try to pronounce T's because I do have a North American uh, accent. I think everybody here is from North America, which is, whoa, we've got Canadians. We've got uh, Arkansans. And when we do mentor camp, and Brett, you know this, when we've done uh, uh, mentor camp in the past, we get loads of uh, Atlantic Canadians coming to uh, um, Arkansas. So there's this great relationship between loads and loads of uh, Atlantic Canadians. And we call ourselves Atlantic Canadians because we're on the Atlantic coast, uh, as opposed to the Pacific coast. You know, those West Coasters, you know who I'm talking about. We don't really mingle with those West Coasters. Although Lululemon is a West Coast, who could have guessed? Who could have guessed a brand like Lululemon would come from the West Coast? So we're going to talk about strategy for startups. Um, if there are any questions, please interact me. Thank you so much, so many of you, for having your cameras on. Um, it really helps me because I actually get my energy by seeing people, seeing if the jokes are landing or the jokes are not landing. So thank you very much indeed. Please interact with me. If you've got any questions, please, please, please interact. Lisa, I love your photo, by the way. Lisa Carroll. Love your photograph. So thank you so much for that. So let's begin. And Doug, great to see Doug Hitchens, who was born in the UK. Doug, great to see you. So we are going to talk about strategy you can use. Let me just expand how many people I can see. There we go. Yeah, I like seeing some people. So I've got a few people on my screen. Please, and I will be asking you questions. I'll be asking you questions like, Sandra, I will say to you, if you did have a question, Sandra, what would your question be? So Megan, Elizabeth, Martha, be on the lookout because I can see you at the moment. So I am going to be asking you, if you had a question, what would it be? Today's focus on strategy you can use. One of the frustrating things about strategy is people often think it only applies to corporates or it only applies to large organizations. What I found was when I did my MBA, and we all know what MBA stands for, must be acknowledged. So I have an MBA and my MBA 
years ago. And one of the things that always struck me about my MBA was how many models I studied. And we've just got Mona Lee joining us. And Mona Lee and I used to work together in the UK. So now we have somebody from the UK as well. So we've got UK, Canada, and Arkansas. Life isn't better than this. So we're going to talk about strategy that you can actually use and the models out of all the models you study on an MBA program. These are the ones that I personally found most relevant. And there are some other models I've come across, like the OST model and the five, uh, the T algorithm model, which I have found very, very useful and have come across more recently. So I will uh, do that. So hopefully you're all on the right um, you're all on the right course, you're on the right time. Uh, as I said, my name is Permjot Valia. I hope I pronounced that properly. And I, I'm also on Twitter. So you can actually, if you, if you want more of this, I'm on Twitter as well. So what do we mean by strategy with a T? First thing, very simply, some people say strategy is simply, how, where are we now? Which actually is a very, very difficult question to answer. A lot of people don't know how to answer that question. Where are we now? Where are we now? Where do we want to go? Where do we want to go? Lots of things about where do you want to go? How do we choose where we're going to go? And then finally, how are we going to get there? And then as leaders, as managers, one of your jobs is to find out what resources are needed to get there. So strategy, very simply put, is where are we? Where do we want to go? How are we going to get there? Now, there are some people who are on this call that I know quite well, or I know your businesses quite well. So when you think about Nova Scotia Health, where is Nova Scotia Health today, Sandra? Where are we today? What metrics are we used to judge where we are today? Where do we want to go? What kind of metrics do we want? What kinds of performance are we going to look for? How are we going to get there? Is it through innovation? Is it through employing more staff? Is it through uh, providing different services? Is it through cutting back on certain services? And then finally, what resources are needed to get there? There will be other people I'd be happy to take examples uh, that if others uh, do want me to talk about their uh, particular business, I'd be more than happy to do that. And once again, Mona Lee, great to see you from Loughborough. We, we worked together many, many years ago, and it's fantastic to see uh, James Bell from Economic Development as well. So this is the strategy workshop. So which frameworks am I going to talk about today? Well, the first one I'm going to talk about is OST, which is something I came across in this book called Winners by Alistair Campbell. It's a great, great book. Alistair Campbell, OST. Really great way to start thinking about strategy and start making sure that what you're doing makes sense. And I use this all the time. I actually use this framework even when I'm planning events, and I'll give you examples of that. Then there's the resources and capabilities model, uh, which is also very, very, very useful. Five forces, most of us are used to that. Most of us who've done any level of business education will have come across Michael Porter's five forces analysis. I also wanna share with you a course I did last year, uh, Scott Galloway, uh, runs this course through section four and it was called the T algorithm and I'm going to go through the T algorithm as well and then finally a model that I find particularly relevant for startups and for people especially commercializing and spinning out of universities and I know Mona Lee that's your uh, responsibility we also have people from Yuji, Yuji Cheng is here from here in Canada, Nova Scotia. He also does a similar thing where he works with universities to help them spin um, companies, particularly in the ocean technology space. And then we've got Doug Hutchins here on this call from the University of Arkansas, who again helps companies do that as well. So there's three or four of you here who are all around the how do we spin out, how do we create innovation? What is OST? OST is simply, what is your objective? What is your strategy? And what are your tactics? Most people get objective, strategy, and tactics confused. And that muddled thinking comes through in what you do. So whenever I'm doing an event, so I'm doing an event actually in three weeks' time, uh, which NSBI have just said, uh, just said they'll sponsor. So thank you very much, Jessica. It's called Short to Short. But what I found very helpful is having an OST one-pager. It's a one-pager. What is the objective for the event? What is the objective of the organization? What is the objective, Martha, for the organization that you're with? Or Megan, what is the objective? The objective is the, you know, the why. Sometimes mission, purpose, although they're slightly different, but for now, let's just you know, use that loosely. Then there's the strategy, which is the how are we gonna get there? 
then the tactics, what are we going to do that takes us further there? So I'm going to start giving you some specific examples. Objectives. It is all about what are you trying to achieve? What are you trying to achieve? Just in one sentence. What are you trying? What is the big picture? It is often confused with strategy. The objective of an organization should never change. The objective of an organization should not change. The objective should not change. And we've now got somebody joining us from Winnipeg as well. Winnipeg. Winnipeg is famous, of course, for everybody will know Winnie the Pooh is named after a, 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 a Winnipeg Zoo, Winnie the Pooh. So there we go, Winnipeg, famous for Winnie the Pooh. So Sandra uh, Hojic, a, a very, very warm welcome to you from Winnipeg and same time zone as Arkansas. Although very weirdly uh, for, for um, Mona Lee, this week, North America changed its time. So these next two weeks, we're only three hours behind you. Very confusing. Time change is not happening at the same time. Although Saskatchewan in Canada is famous for never changing its time. Woohoo! Got to be famous for something. Why not make it that? So objective. What are you trying to achieve? What is the big picture? Often confused with strategy. It should not change. And it should be motivating. It should be the glue. Culture is part of the objective. Do not hire people who don't understand the objective. A big mistake a lot of startups make is they find people who don't actually share the objective. Interesting enough, the data on hiring people, when you're a startup, hire people for cultural fit, not skill fit. As you, go, as you get larger as a company, as you start scaling, you do need to hire people for skills. But initially, you need to hire people who share that objective. Very, very, very important, very important. So strategy, how will you achieve the objective? I love the idea of strategy being one word approach. I'm going to give you an example of a client in New Brunswick that I actually worked with, where they worked with lots of strat uh, strategy consultants and, and strategic consultants always come up with very, very long winded strategy statements. And I came up with a one word approach. If you can define your strategy in one word, it's really helpful. And I'm going to give you uh, an example. And if the strategy if you're one sentence, if you're one word, if your strategy cannot be understood by everyone in the organization, it has no value at all. Strategy is not something that is done at the sea level and that no one else understood. So when you've got a big organization, and I think one of the largest organizations here is probably Nova Scotia Health, if you have a strategy that not everyone in the organization can say, this is the strategy, this is how I contribute to that strategy, it's, it has no meaning. It has absolutely no meaning. So let me give you some examples of strategy, of one word strategies later on when I give you specific examples. Tactics are then the ways to deliver the strategy. It empowers people in the organization to deliver the strategy because they understand the strategy because they use tactics. It can change, but it must be aligned. It must be aligned to strategy. One of the things you've got to do as managers is you've got to monitor how effective tactics are and you keep changing. So growth or viral marketing, that is very tactics driven, uh, not strategic, it's tactical, which is what are we doing that's working? How can we measure that it's working? How can we constantly revisit working? So a big example, Alistair Campbell, who wrote uh, the book Winners, he talked about the Labour Party in the United Kingdom where he was uh, heavily involved in them and he worked with Tony Blair, he was Tony Blair's chief of staff. So he said the objective, his objective when he joined the Labour Party was to win power, to win the election. The strategy was one word, modernization. Because many people perceived that the Labour Party was stuck in the past. It was trying to get rid of its old left dogma, socialist dogma. We must modernize. And then there were loads and loads of tactics that people were empowered with that had to achieve the, the strategy of modernization that would achieve in his mind would modernization would, would be the best way to achieve the objective of winning power. So let me give you an example of a bakery I worked with. The bakery I worked with, um, Mrs. Dunster's Pie, their objective is to be the leading supplier of morning goods, bakery, morning goods to Atlantic Canada. So that was their objective. Very easy, very straightforward to understand. Yeah, we all understand that to be the leading provider of morning goods to Atlantic Canada. 
strategy. They had lots and lots of work done on this. I just came up with the word fresh or freshness. That is your strategy. That strategy then helps everyone in the organization with decision-making. So the decision-making is, is what I'm doing now gonna make the products less or more fresh? Where do we locate our plants? How do we hire people? How do we do customer service? How do we organize our logistics? Everything is organized around this strategy of fresh. Very, very simple. Then there was a paint company I was working with. This paint company based here in Nova Scotia uh, is able to do paint that is so green, you can actually, with wasted paint, you can actually put it in your compost and you can actually post this paint through the post box. So their objective was to become a, 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 a leading supplier of paint. Their strategy was, uh, the strategy we came up with was to create a platform where we would actually get painters to sell the paint because we could show them the huge health benefits of using our paint compared to traditional paint. Everybody, everybody, I don't think, especially in January and February, uh, always is played by weight loss. Weight loss is a really good example where people get objective strategy tactics confused. People say, I want to lose weight. That is actually uh, an, an objective. Better objective is the why. Why do you want to lose weight? And then you might find that actually other things might be better for you than trying to lose weight. But let's just assume that the objective is to lose weight. The strategy is the how. So just saying I want to lose weight doesn't lead to success. Saying I am going to lose weight through actually the most effective way I lost weight was Brett Amorine, your dad. Your dad and I had a bet for charity. That was the most effective way I have ever lost weight. It was over a three month period. And I, I think I just beat your dad in, in the three month period, but that was because we, 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 that was the strategy that worked for me. But the strategy has to be something like through a combination of healthy eating and diet, I will lose weight. The tactics then are what exercise, how often are you gonna exercise? Where's the exercise advice coming from? Nutrition, what are you gonna eat? When are you gonna eat them? Are you gonna count the calories? So that's an example of an objective, a strategy, and the tactics. Are there any questions whatsoever? Because I want to stop share. Are there any questions at this stage from anybody here? Because I'm going to pick on someone. You know, I'm going to pick on someone. So if someone has a question, that'd be great. If not, yes. yeah, great. Sandra, Sandra has a question. Sandra Hossage. You're, so, you're very surprised that I'm raising my hand. I know this. Um, so just kind of selfishly as you're talking about, you know, how we outline the objective, what goes first, um, and sort of the goal, and then operationalizing that in the strategy, how we do that, and then the tactics of getting into even more detail. So right now, I'm involved in a project uh, with an organization I'm working with that kind of wants us to work on this large multi-organizational strategy. And if I had to pick a word for what they're trying to do, it would probably be more focused on modernization. Uh, they've left it up to the different areas and divisions to define how they do that. So keeping in mind some of the ordering and focus of how we do what we do and how to activate strategy and operationalize it, what, what would we look at first there? Because it's kind of like a mammoth thing right now. It's just, I would, I would argue it's too conceptual still. I guess my question would be, is it okay that it's conceptual right now? Um, does that oper operationalization around the tactics and honing in on the strategy, is it okay if that's left to the different areas? Or do you think there needs to be consensus at this level, what that is, and then let that guide all the areas and how they kind of um, define it more down the road? If Does that make sense? It does, it does make sense. And it's a really good question. And there's this great principle of subsidiarity. Where are decisions best made? At what level are decisions best made? And what's really interesting is uh, in, in North America, in Canada and in the United States, we have federal systems of government. So we often, uh, often have this principle of subsidiarity where are decisions best made? That is also true for organizations. At what level is it appropriate for decisions to be made? Now, the strategy does need to be the glue that means something to everyone. So if I went to somebody who has just joined the organization or <coughs> working at the lowest rung of the organization, I'd say modernization, 
what does that mean to them? If it means nothing to them, then it's a bad strategy. If it means that if they understand, oh, that means us upgrading the way we do this, upgrading the way we do this, uh, using technology wherever we can, doing this wherever we can, great, then it's working. So the acid test of strategy is, do people at every level of the organization understand? Too many times strategy is understood at the C-suite. And then they're surprised that the strategy is not working. Well, it's not working because it's groupthink. You will think, I mean, we know what's going on in the world right now in, in, in Russia. And, and a, that's a classic example where um, the strategy was formulated by someone who didn't actually understand what was going, going on on the ground floor, what was actually happening, what was the reality of, on the ground. So one of the things you've got to do as leaders of an organization, you've got to understand, does this strategy galvanize? Does it mean something to people at every level in the organization? So Sandra, always happy to talk to you afterwards if, if you have a more detailed thing, because I think that question deserves a bit more time, but I'm happy to do that. But yes, the answer is you do need to do that. I mean, mon ami, vous avez question? Terrible French, but I hope that I hope you understood what I meant. You have a question. Je suis désolé, ce n'est pas le écouté. May uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry for that. So may I ask you? I, I believe, okay, there is something missing in OST. What's I that? believe I should say maybe we can share further vision, the just cause, first. I believe because, and then maybe we can talk about what is the, the objective and what is the difference about the goal. So, yes, so please advise, you know. Sure, so I mean, there is different language that we can use. So I think I'm using objective. Some people will use mission, some people will use purpose, some people will use different words. So I'm not disagreeing with you. Uh, so some people will say mission, goal, um, you know, tactics. Um, I'm using objective, strategy, tactics. For me, it's just, uh, I like using the word objective because it doesn't matter what kind of organization you are. And I think one of the problems with using the word mission is um, if you read the book, Think Again by Adam Grant, he talks about this and it's a very, very powerful thing. When you use words like mission, and again, something like Nova Scotia Health, very important. Sorry, uh, not, uh, sorry to, disturb, uh, to, to stop you, it's not mission, vision. Vision, 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 vision mission. Vision, Same, yeah. Yeah, just yeah, vision, just mission. Just the Absolutely. No, it's the same kind of thing about the different language you use. Okay. One of the things, when you use words like vision, when you use words like purpose, when you use words like mission, you end up falling into the classic trap of preaching, prosecuting, or politicking. And that is something you have to avoid. So with language, you've got to be very careful what kind of language you use. And I try to use language that is very value free, which is objective strategy tactics. Now you might disagree because strategy comes from the Greek for the art of war. Uh, so you might disagree and you say you can't do strategy without having some values. But I think mission, vision, they can, can, they can work. But what I don't like is vision by, by necessity belongs to one person and like you've got to have a shared purpose. You've got to have a shared objective. You've got to have something that everybody can understand. So I'm not disagreeing with you. I mean, I'm just saying that there may be different, uh, different ways of achieving in terms of language. Another participant has raised their hand and I can't see who that participant is. Does someone else uh, have That's me, Prem Joe. Yes, yes, um, yes, Yuji. Yeah, so um, to your points and, uh, you know, high level value, mission, vision, like whatever you frame it, um, I find that and we've seen a lot of uh, an organization, especially uh, research based businesses, technology companies are really trying to deliver high quality, very, very high quality product or services to customers. Uh, and those could be their mission, uh, vision, uh, or, you know, value. But how do you, you know, def define that balance or drive that balance between, you know, having a more agile organization, uh, you know, constant improvement and, you know, delivering high quality? Because you also want to execute, execute, and execute. You want to be very fast. So, Yuji, I'll stop. Uh, one thing I'll say is I would disagree. I disagree. That is not an objective. That is a strategy. That is not the objective. The objective is not to deliver high quality products. That's, that's how you do so. That's a strategy. That is how you achieve an objective. So the objective must be to simplify people's lives, to take stress away, to uh, give people back more time. It must be something else. How we deliver that objective, the strategy is 
we deliver high quality products. The tactics of then how we deliver high, high quality products consistently forms the day-to-day -day operations. And to Sandra's, uh, Sandra Hodgett's point about how do you then operationalize that? So, so again, that's a really good example where an objective and a strategy is confused. Nobody gets excited by, we want you to join this organization. Martha, I want you to come and join this organization because we're going to deliver high quality products. Which organization says it is our objective to deliver terrible products? Terrible products. No organization will say that. So that is a really good example where saying we're going to deliver high quality products is not, a, a not an objective. It is a strategy. It is how you're going to achieve something else. All right. Thank you very, very much indeed. And I will, with your permission, move on to the next bit of the uh, presentation, which is now talking about resources and capabilities. Really, so this was really formed by um, some, what happened with strategy? Strategy started in the 1950s and 60s being taught and, and Michael Porter was one of the first teachers. Michael Porter was an economist. So the thing about economists is, and I'm an economist with a background, we always look at things in, in, at an industry level. At an industry, and there are great writers like Rita McGrath. She's at the Columbia Business School, and she talks about how it's really the end of thinking about things in terms of industries and thinking more about things in terms of arenas. But another counter school was the Resources and Capability School, where they said, "Don't think about things in terms of industry, but think in terms of your competitive advantages come through the resources and your capabilities." And the way to think about it is really, what is your secret source? The secret source is not having a mission to deliver high quality pro products. The secret source is the consistency, the processes you use, the ingredients you buy, whatever it is that turns those um, resources, turns those inputs into huge, huge capabilities that the client wants. What are you uniquely placed to do that turns the things that I could buy Martha, what is your, uh, what business are you in, Martha Longerdin? Londigan, London, Londigan, sorry. What is the business you're in? Um, I work at Startup Genty. So we're, yeah. Um, and so our purpose is always to serve and build the entrepreneur community. Um, okay. And so, you know, it's always been kind of taught to me that purpose is why you do what you do. And then vision is what that looks like out for us out in the community and then you know the mission is how we do it um yeah. and so but we always to me the purpose has always got to be foremost because it's why we're doing it so when we examine an idea for a new program do we want to seek a grant to do something new it always has to go back to the original um purpose and, and the, the mission and the vision might change as we add to that. But that's why to me, you know, people talk about it. It's so silly to write all this stuff. You've got to always go back to the why. I don't know. That's just the way I've, you know, kind of I looked at it. Martha, I totally agree. And when you're having a disagreement with someone, always go back to the why. So you can, like, do we, it, it's very difficult to have, an, uh, to agree and argue with someone if you want to go different places. Steve Jobs said this apparently, that it's okay disagreeing with how we're going to get to San Diego from say LA, but it's not okay if half of you want to go to San Diego, half of you want to go to San Francisco, then we can't, you know, there, there's, there, there's no agreement. So you've got to agree what the objective is. But if we think about Startup Junkie uh, a Consulting, and this applies to a lot of you, what you're really doing is if you think about it, other, lots of other people can hire consultants, a lot of other people can, uh, can hire space, a lot of people can hire speakers like me, lots and lots of people can do that. But what are you uniquely placed to do that turns those assets into unique capabilities? So I think it's your community ethos, it's the actual quality of people that you have that when combined, so when you combine somebody like Katie, who's technically brilliant, and you, you combine someone like Katie with someone like Brett, and then you add someone like Caleb into the mix with a very, very different skill set in terms of community and all of that stuff. Suddenly you've got these assets that other organizations could hire, but when those three assets come together, they create magic. They create magic. And it's that kind of stuff. So I've seen the way Katie speaks to university researchers 
And it's, wow, she has that ability to really kind of get through to them. So I think a lot of that is you've got to ask yourself, what are you uniquely placed to do that turns your assets into unique capabilities? And actually, Sandra Crowell, when we talk about innovation in organizations like health organizations, this is one of the areas where those organizations struggle, that they have all these assets, but they haven't worked out what combination of what combination do we need to turn these assets into unique capabilities. It's really like thinking about a, a really good chef. Uh, two chefs will have the same ingredients, but some chefs have that magic ability to turn those assets into something wow. Another chef just can't do that. And it's really interesting. Strategy can be thought like uh, resource and capabilities. What are you uniquely placed to do that turns those assets into unique capabilities? If, if I told somebody what the Coca-Cola formula was, uh, you're not going to suddenly launch a rival to Coke. Coca-Cola now is much, much more than simply its recipe, much more than that. And the idea behind this strategic thinking is focus on that. Focus on what are you uniquely well-placed to be able to do. Then quickly, there's the Porter's Five Forces Analysis, which uh, those of you who've studied business at any level will, will uh, be familiar with. Porter, unlike resources and capabilities, looks at it at an industry level. And he looks at the, the, the drivers of profitability in an industry. So these are the things that will determine your profit margins. Now, when I started as an investor, an angel investor, I would use this analysis to, to look at um, which businesses you should go into and which business I shouldn't. The strength of suppliers. If you have a business that needs a key component like chips, uh, like uh, you know silicon chips that we've all realized during this uh, the last two or three years are very, very, very difficult to get hold of, the supplier strength will determine your profitability. The strength of your customers will determine your profitability. If you have, there's something, we all know what monopoly is. A monopoly is uh, one producer, many customers. You also have something called a monopsony. A monopsony is someone like Walmart in, in Arkansas, where they will be one buyer, many suppliers. So on, on, uh, Walmart will often do monopsony arrangements with people where they say, I will buy everything you can produce, but you only sell to me. So that when you have a monopsony arrangement, the profitability will be determined by the strength of the customer. What are the barriers to entry? So one of the things doctors, lawyers, accountants do is they erect barriers. There's that joke, you know, there's that charity, Doctors Without Borders, and there's another charity, Doctors Without Diplomas, you know, which not many people raise money for. But one, one of the things about doctors and all these things is there are barriers to entry. Lawyers, there are barriers to entry. So one of the first things these industry associations will do is create these barriers to entry. And that keeps, that actually keeps the, margins within the industry very, very high. So what are the barriers to entry? Threat of substitutes and in intensity of competition. Now, this is really interesting. If you had done this analysis for, uh, uh, to look at Starbucks in say 1995, you would have concluded that it's not worth investing in Starbucks because you would have taken a strength of suppliers. Well, there, there's no really there's no strength there, but you know there are loads and loads of supplies of coffee beans. Strength of customers: customers can walk into any coffee shop they want. Barriers to entry: anybody can open a coffee shop. You can even just open up a coffee cart. So the barriers to entry are very very slim. Threat of substitute: there's tea, there's alcohol, there's energy drinks, there's Coca Cola. There's so many things which are a, a substitute. The intensity of competition: huge. Coffee shop can't be that. Despite this, Starbucks succeeded because what they recognized was, you know, we go to the resources and capabilities model, they didn't sell coffee. They sold the third place. It is not home, not the office, but something in between. And Starbucks were uniquely able to exploit that ability to turn those assets into capabilities. Even the way they did the chairs at three different levels was to create that it's not a canteen, it's not a home, Whereas pre-Starbucks, a lot of coffee shops looked like lounges and all looked like canteens. It was very, very strange. So that's the five forces. Now, one of my favorite ones, something I came across recently is the T algorithm. The T algorithm is a study of trillion dollar companies, trillion dollar companies, and what are the characteristics that they share? Now, there are eight here. I've only listed uh, five. 
but there are eight characteristics that these companies share. Now, what's interesting is you think trillion dollar company, how can I apply that to a startup? Funnily enough, I actually use this with a client that's a community college in New Brunswick. So I actually work with New Brunswick Community College and we use this to create some really, really good strategies, which is let's look at the characteristics that these trillion dollar companies have in common. One of the things that's not mentioned here is they are very clear on which human instinct they appeal to, so they know that. They're also very good at offering a career accelerant. So talent will join these companies knowing that there will be a strong, strong uh, career, it'll be a good career move that even when they leave the organization, uh, so startup, startup junkie, if you look at people who left startup junkie, they have gone on to, or every single one of them without fail has gone on to do great things. So Startup Junkie Consulting is a great career accelerant. And sometimes you actually recruit people saying, I only want you to be here two, three, four years. I do want you to move on, but where you're gonna move on to is gonna be great, but it's a great way to attract talent. And Parsa, the, one yes. thing I'll say is, you know, staying focused as your business grows. And I know with Startup Junkie, you can't be all things to all people. And so staying focused, like with us, our focus is to build entrepreneurship because we firmly believe that entrepreneurship, business ownership improves lives, families, and communities, okay? So, you know, we're constantly getting asked, like, because I have a legal background, people want me to come speak at a, a women's legal conference or at a banking, con you know, and I have to pull them back down and say, that's not my mission, but I could come talk to your attorney's group to get you interested in providing legal services to help startups. I could come talk to your banking group to educate you about how to work with first-time borrowers to start a business. So we have to keep it, people get excited about what you're doing or even your store and they'll say, hey, add this line or add this. And you've got to pull back to your purpose or you're just going to get, you're going to, you can't be everything to everybody. And that's why it's so important to me Absolutely. to have this. There's a slide uh, on my last slide, but I'll share it with you now. One of my great trainers, uh, mentors is a guy called Mike Sikorsky, who has been to Winnipeg. We brought him to Winnipeg. We brought him to um, uh, Cape Breton and we brought him to uh, Arkansas as well. And he says, none of the world's best restaurants do a buffet none of the world's best restaurants do a buffet and i think that martha encompasses exactly what you're saying which is uh, that they all do you know when you go to a great restaurant you say what is the one dish you're famous for i'll have that please every restaurant has one thing that they're good at and it's really important you stick to i don't trust a restaurant you could go to and say here's the menu this is the italian section of the menu this is the indian section of the menu this is the chinese section you you just know the food's going to be terrible you just do you just do so it's very very important the other thing that from the t algorithm you've got to think about is these companies have managed normally there's this thing about growth or margins so if you're pursuing growth your margins may suffer if you're pursuing margins your growth may suffer these companies, these trillion dollar companies and fast growing companies have really understood how do I grow and grow my margins? So I really have a think about how do I grow and how do I grow my margins? Vertical integration is very important. How can I move upwards or downwards? So a good example of Spotify is they recognize that they couldn't, unless they do their own phone or their hardware product, uh, they have to use uh, um, the Apple rail tracks to sell their to their customers. Think about it, they have to pay a 30% tax to their competitor every time somebody wants to buy their product. So one of the things they've done is, they, and this is why they made big moves in acquiring podcasts, Spotify want to own podcasting. So the, 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 that's why they paid as much as they did for the Joe Rogan series. Uh, that's why they commissioned the star of uh, the thing they did with uh, Barack Obama and Bruce Springsteen. They are really wanting to own podcasts. They're like, how can we be different? So they did that vertical integration. Be very clear which human instinct you appeal to. Is it knowledge? Is it caring? Is it consumption or is it ego? Be very clear that you understand which human instinct you appeal to. Companies, again, to Martha's point, that try to appeal to more than one or aren't clear about which human instinct they appeal to often get confused. Likeability, very important, very, very important. There is a reason why people invest so much in PR and communications and to be likable. And what they learned was from uh, um, Microsoft in the mid 90s, Microsoft in the mid 90s with, with Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer was probably the most hated company on the planet. 
it was hated beyond belief. And what the new Titans, they learned from that. So uh, Facebook hired someone like Sheryl Sandberg, who's so likable. And, uh, you know, she's there for her likability. Um, you have Tim Cook investing enormous amounts of money to be likable. The more likable you are, the more you are able to grow as a business. And of course, storytelling is a very, very important part of this. Then there's also things like the Benjamin Button effect or, or network effects, as it's called, uh, which is the more you use something, the more valuable it gets, network effects. Again, health is one of these things that we really haven't exploited that characteristic, but it's very, very important to do that. The more people use it, the more valuable it gets. Then the final model, which I will focus on, and we'll absolutely finish on time, the final model is strategy is about identifying and defending your most valuable competitive position. This is uh, something which I really, really like. And this is the thing that I think brings all of the different things we're talking about. And DJ, thank you for your comments in the chat, book, uh, chat box. And I think this brings it all together, which is your most competitive valuable position is where X is. It's where your values, your opportunities, and your capabilities intersect. What do I mean by values? The purpose, why do you exist? What really drives you? How should the world look? Now, this is very relevant to governments and to, uh, to, to nonprofits. You know, what are your values? What is the purpose? Why do you want entrepreneurs to better? I remember talking to Jessica McCall from, from, from Nova Scotia. Uh, some time ago, and, and, and Jessica works in economic development. And what was really interesting talking to her, she articulated, that, and I hadn't heard this before really, she articulated that economic development was important to her because all of the things we want to afford, such as good healthcare, such as good roads, such as good transportation, such as good schools, all of it starts with a good, a good tax base. You need a good tax base. So for her, uh, working in economic development for a government entity was very important because it was uh, the values piece was she understood there's this big link between the work I do today and the health service my children and their children will be enjoy tomorrow. So that's, that's the kind of uh, values. That's a really good example of values where it's the glue that underpins culture. And I've not heard people articulate that more. And I, I really like it. And I think more and more of us should celebrate if we're working for something like Startup Junkie Consulting or we're working for universities in economic development, it is that glue. You are pivotal in driving um, the services that we all depend by having that thriving tax base. And actually, the more entrepreneurs there are, the more people there are paying tax, the lower the tax rates can be. So it doesn't matter what your ideology is on that, it's always a good thing to have a great tax base. So that's a good example of values. Um, but then you've got to make sure that with your values aren't just the values that the CEO has. Uh, are the stakeholders aligned? Who are your stakeholders? Would they agree on what your values are? And often, uh, uh, you know, uh, that's very important. Doug, great to see you, Doug, uh, uh, Doug Hutchins. One of the things, Doug, I thought you did very well as a CEO of, uh, of the company that you were with. You communicated your values regularly and often. And that is very, very important. I remember you coming to pick me up once at the airport in the shittiest car I've ever been in. But that was you putting your values into practice. It really, really was. And I, I actually love the story you told about that. And that, that is very important. How do you put these values into practice? How do you have that authenticity? So have a think about what are your values? Then we talk about capabilities. What are they? What are your capabilities? Are they unique when they're blended? And also this question that a lot of startups have that should you have them internal or should they be outsourced? And is your capability in actually bringing these capabilities together? Is that your capability that you can bring these things together? And how hard is it to imitate that magic? How hard is that? So have a think about that, about your capabilities. Very, very important part. And then the way there are some tools you can do to identify where your capabilities really lie and where you can have the most importance. Think about the value chain. Think about, so if you think about a, a health authority, if you think about the typical, value, the, the typical journey somebody who accesses healthcare services goes through or startup junkie goes through or the organization you're working through in, in, in New Brunswick, Sandra, or UG, think about that. Or think about the work you're doing and just think about the journey 
the client go through. Where are you adding value? Where are you detracting value? Hotels do this all the time and get it wrong often. They don't, they, they identify the wrong areas where they think they're adding value and they don't put enough emphasis on things that actually take away value. So have a think about that. How do you assess the alignment of capabilities? The other thing you've got to realize is a lot of your capabilities will become albatrosses around your neck. Capabilities, client expectations change all the time. So one of the assets of Starbucks was all of this real estate, that you're only ever a five minute drive away from a Starbucks. That asset very quickly during the pandemic became a huge liability. Real estate became a real liability for lots of people. So you've got to also always be thinking, how does your capability advantage be sustained over time? Because a lot of capabilities will degrade and they'll, you'll have to be flexible enough in your thinking to recognize a lot of the way we deliver health, a lot of the way we deliver the service our business provides is going to change. And a way to think about value change is how, what, what is the process by changing inputs into outputs? How do you go from changing a diagnosis into a, into a happy patient who's cured? Where does the value occur? Work through every, every stage, and this will give you a very good look, idea of where your capabilities are. So really think about those capabilities. Then finally, big problem for startups. We actually have too many opportunities. We have way too many opportunities. And often people, uh, those of us who've been mentoring startups, those of us who work with startup junkie consultants, work with startups, often, Katie, we have this issue all the time. Then we were working with startups coming out of university. They have way too many opportunities. I don't know where to go with that. I don't know where to do that. So think about those opportunities, rank them, rank the opportunities. Is it ease of access, distance to cash, ability to charge a premium, monopoly? Which ones have barriers? And again, none of the world's best transfers have a buffet. So think about how can you pursue which opportunities, but then which opportunities match your values. So if we have a certain purpose and actually we find this business opportunity and these entrepreneurs want advice on doing businesses, which we believe are harmful to health, harmful to individuals, harmful to the environment, et cetera, we may not wish to you know help with those businesses because we think it goes against our purpose so and that's where a lot of startup founders talk about you know burnout burnout being a big thing with uh, with uh, you know being just burnt, being run down and stuff i found that often being run down being burnt out is when the values of the organization change from your values so one of the things i think is very important for your health is to actually make sure that you are always personally aligned with the organization that your values and the organization values are aligned. You see that big disconnect and you see that, that the stress it causes people when they're not aligned. So have a think about that because that is very, very important. So think about what your current opportunities are right now and how are you? So here are some questions for you. Where is your X? But X is never fixed. What will cause X, you know, where opportunities, values and capabilities intersect? What will cause that to shift? How can you prepare for that shift today? What capabilities do you need to invest in? So one of the things you should be thinking of is, well, these are all the opportunities. We don't have the, we have the values, but we don't have the capabilities to pursue these opportunities. So our business model, the reason we want to raise a million dollars, half a million dollars is to build up the capabilities to pursue these opportunities. And then think about what bets you should be placing and think like you're placing bets. Place lots and lots of small bets, not one or two big bets. Think about what bets you should be placing. So that is the end of my presentation and we have time. I always wanna leave time for uh, some questions for you. So I do wanna say thank you just in case you, you leave me, but I'm now gonna stop the share and I'm now gonna ask you all uh, for questions. So who shall I pick on first? Uh, me Megan, Megan, I saw you, you knew I was gonna pick on you. I saw that smile before I even looked at you. I saw that little smile. Megan, <laughs> if you did have a question, what would your question be? Um, so a little background about myself so, so that it makes little sense. Um, so I own a little dessert company called Pineapple Bliss and we, um, sell soft serve. 
Um, and we try to make everything diet and allergy friendly. So we're always placing allergy information um, on our daily posts when we switch our flavors and on our website so that people who have, you know, an allergy to corn or dyes or gluten, um, dairy, you know, everything have access to that. So we're trying to make dessert fun and easy and, and no stress. Um, so I took um, the 10X conductor class and I since opened a second storefront location. Um, so my, my next goal, uh, well, I have two goals, um, one being to franchise and the second being to private label and make some of our own uh, soft serve formulations. Um, during the pandemic, I noticed a lot of companies um, whose products we were using started using different ingredients, cheaper ingredients, and started adding dyes and stuff back in that previously had not used those. Um, so I guess my question would be like, the, the, they're really expensive. So my goal would be to offer the great product, which would require me to have to, um, private label and then also to franchise. So I'm kind of in a position where, you know, which, which comes first or do they come at the same time? And then how do I acquire, um, financing so that I am not just stuck in a ton of debt you know what options are there for someone like me trying to do something like that that um like I just spent a lot of um the money I had saved on my second location so you know I don't want to miss an opportunity because we are always getting franchise inquiries but that's kind of where I'm at <laughs> there's a lot to unpack and I don't think yeah. I can help you with everything but again happy to do a one-to-one -one, uh through startup junkie if if if, if needed oh, yeah. but, but one, one of the things you've got to do is now that you've got a second location with a franchise do you think about what is it a franchisee is buying is there a bible is there a is there a, a, a very very strong document about the processes have you mastered the process of doing franchise or do you need another one store or two store and i think you then get investors on board so you reduce your uh, debt and you reduce your personal exposure level i actually don't like some investors do i don't a lot of investors say i won't invest in you until you've demonstrated real commitment by being uh, in, in debt yourself, being putting everything on the line. I don't like that. I don't think you are going to. I've been in debt. I've been under enormous pressure. I do not make good decisions when I'm under that pressure. I just do not make good decisions. So this idea that you've got to be over leveraged mm -hmm. is, is not healthy. Um, have a little less debt, have a little less of the business, but sleep better at night. Always, 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 always uh, uh, good advice. So, but you can raise investment at a good level if you do have a franchisable opportunity. And what I love about franchising model is you can get it to work. You get upfront cash into the business and therefore I will be raising money to build the franchise Bible, documentation, management training. What is a franchisee buying? and just make it better and better and better. And at the moment, don't give up an area franchise, just give up store per store, but build up a, that thing so you can just keep increasing the value chain, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So where would I even start to find an investor? <laughs> oh, uh, I think Startup Junkie can help you. If oh, you talk to Startup okay. Junkie, they, because one of the things is, and again, one of the most successful investments Startup Junkie did is, well, not Startup Junkie, but uh, Brett Amarine and Jeff Amarine, they also run something called Tonic Ventures. So they're very, very closely linked. I happen to be an investor in it. And we invested in Slim Chickens. Oh. So they have, they have experience of actually investing in some great franchisable brands. So talk to them. How do they raise money? How do they do it? They're there to help. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Reach out thank to you. me, Megan, and we'll get you connected. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. They're, they're, they're great. They're Arkansans. Megan, are you from Arkansas? Uh, Arkansas? Uh, yes. One of my stars is in um, uh, Springdale, Arkansas, and then one is in Joplin, Missouri. Sorry. Yeah, so Arkansas is great. Okay. going crazy. You've got all the support you need in Arkansas. Yep. So, yeah. so I want to ask Elizabeth, then I'm going to ask Sandra if you had a question, and then I want to ask Phil. Someone else, Elizabeth, Sandra, and then Phil for your next question. So Elizabeth, if you had a question, what would your question be? 
Um, what you said about staying personally aligned with the organization really resonated with me. I'm very, very early stage of developing a women's health product and the imposter syndrome creeps in constantly of like, what am I doing? How am I doing this? Am I the person to be doing this? When I know that I am, I'm a mom, I've experienced a lot of the pain points that this product is helping to solve. Do you have any advice on how to address some of the imposter syndrome that I'm sure a lot of us feel I, on the I rig? Have, <laughs> I was asked this question on Sunday. I was doing this workshop with uh, um, a, a, a group of um, uh, people of color and, uh, and women. And I was asked about imposter syndrome and I gave the answer the audience wanted to hear. I didn't give the answer I really wanted to give. Mm -hmm. So now I don't know. Do I give you the answer that I think you should hear? Yes, no. <laughs> Give us a real one. <laughs> Do you know what? Because it's only I'm, I'm sorry to tell you something, okay? There's a word I did not like a lot to hear it, okay? When you say people of color. Uh, white, if we, if we consider color, what does it mean first color? In physics, I'm gonna, I'm black I'm, and white I'm, are, are not I'm color. In. I'm in. I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to stop you there. I've muted you. That is a great conversation. I'm very, very happy to have. It's not a conversation I'm going to have today. It's in a very happy conversation. I had this conversation today. The organization in Canada uses the word black, indigenous, and people of color, BIPOC. That is the language they use. They will inform me and I'll be guided by the language that they tell me. But that is a conversation I'm more than happy to have uh, another time. So Elizabeth, one other thing uh, I, I would say is, um, what I would have said is pretend you're a, a, a man and see what happens see what happens because they don't seem to suffer from imposter syndrome. I don't get asked by men. How do you deal with imposter syndrome? I only get asked by women and uh, people of color. How do you deal with imposter syndrome? So that's what I mean by think, just, just think if I wasn't a uh, female, would I think like this? Why am I thinking like this? And also, you know your stuff. There are some areas where we have imposter syndrome. Of course we do. I have that all the time. Every time I'm about to do a presentation, I get nervous. You don't know what question you're going to get asked. So I, I always feel a little bit nervous. But there are things you know. Nobody knows better than you what it's like to juggle the various pressures you have. And you're trying to create a business that is absolutely aligned, not just with your personal values, but with your personal uh, how you live your life. So I don't know if that helps at all or whether you wish I gave you the answer that I gave the audience, um, but I really believe that because I just find it weird that I never get asked that question by, uh, you know, men. I just don't. Uh, and yet I get asked that question all the time uh, from women. How do I deal with imposter syndrome? Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. Sandra, if you had a question, what would your question be? And then I'm going to come to Phil. So Primjot, I'm just leaving a 30 year research career to venture into a new job as a VP operations for a startup company. And I'm very new at this, although I'm excited about the opportunity. So I'm wondering, my question to you would be, what's the best book that I should read or resource that I should go to, to get me started and immersed in this startup world? Oh, wow, wow, that is, there are so many great books to read, Sandra. One of the things I would say is the big difference between startup and corporate. And a lot of you have worked in Arkansas, a lot of you work for big corporates and done startups. The big difference is with, start, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a corporate, with something like 30 years, you are looking at skills around exploiting an existing business model, exploiting an existing business model. Startup, you are searching for a business model. You're exploring. So the big difference is exploitation versus exploring. So great books to read about how to explore a business model are things like Eric Ries, uh, Lean Startup, uh, Business Model Generator. There are loads and loads of workshops that are organized by Dow, by Volta, uh, uh, lots and lots of great resources, Startup Junkie Consulting. Here you are. I know we only live quite close to each other, but here you are in, in a workshop being put on by Arkansas. These resources are global. These resources are global. There's so many great content. So find one or two speakers that you find interesting, find out where they're speaking, and just go to their workshops wherever they are in the world. Does that help? Perfect. Phil, if you had a question, what would your question be, Phil? Uh, you talked some about storytelling earlier, and uh, 
incubator program that I'm running is talking a lot about this with our early stage startups. What tools do you provide or recommend to entrepreneurs who are trying to improve their storytelling skills? Right. Um, um, use Disney as a structure, use Pixar as a structure, or use um, the AIDCA model. Uh, and one of the workshops I did do with a Callum, uh, I think the last workshop we did was actually storytelling. And I did a three-part series with the University of Arkansas on storytelling. Uh, but what I do is start off with the, um, and there's a, another great book by Chip and Dan Heath uh, called, uh, uh, was it Stick? It's called... Uh, Make It Stick. Made, made to Stick, Made to Stick. And they use that acronym success. Uh, keep it simple, keep it unexpected, keep it credible, make it concrete, make it emotional and have a surprise. Oh, I remembered, wow. Uh, so that, that, so that, that's a great book, but I really, really love the Disney style that Daniel Pink talks about, which is, you know, once upon a time, every day until one day, because of that, because of that, they all lived happily ever after. You use that as the structure to create a great, great story, which I find very, very, very powerful. Uh, so yeah, and there are great people like Richard Mulholland from The Missing Link in Cape Town. Uh, look at what he does. He is the person I go to for storytelling advice. Thank you. So Doug and then Casey, uh, I'm going to quickly go to you. Doug, if you had a question, what would your question be? Yeah, um, so I'm always fascinated by the difference between B2C and B2B. Is there any subtlety in kind of the approaches you talked about, especially OST for B2B versus B2C? Yes, you need completely different skill sets. So one of, one of the things also is, uh, and often people don't get that. Uh, uh, I can do B2B sales. I'm very good at B2B sales. I cannot do B2C. I just cannot do B2C. B2C is about marketing. B2B is about business development sales. So the, the key driver of success in B2C is your cost of client acquisition. Your key success in B2B is retention and upselling to your business. So there are big, big differences. One is really marketing, one is really sales. That's my opinion. Lots of people disagree. That's just what I've learned. And I've got a data set of, uh, it's a limited data set, but that's my, uh, my insights. Perfect, thank you. Does that help? Does that help? Yep, right, thank you. Casey. Um, well, I didn't want to run. I have to go to another meeting so I don't have a good question, but I wanted to say uh, thanks. Uh, I really appreciate the presentation and uh, the questions too. It's a good crew. So good to see Thank you. you. Thank you, Casey. Thank you very much. Um, Lisa, I know I, I've not been able to see Lisa. Oh, thank you. Outstanding. Lisa, did you have a question? Uh, no, no, just uh, you are very, very, very welcome, Lisa. Uh, it's my pleasure. If you did have a question, uh, always happy. Uh, uh, James, uh, I, I love, love, love working with you on a mentoring group, and uh, thank you so much. Flattered that you're you're joining us, and thank you for that. Uh, James, did you have a question? I should unmute if I'm going to actually ask a question, huh? Um, I've been playing, uh, uh, been working on something else and listening in. No, I don't have a question. Great to see you, Vermjet. It's great to see you. Uh, great to see you, James, and I hope all is well, and I hope we get to work together, and I hope that I'm back in Arkansas very, very soon. Because we've only- Come on. On, on, on Zoom. Oh, I, I was gonna be there in January, but then Omicron had other ideas, but it'd be great to see all of you. And uh, uh, yeah, like you all know, I just absolutely love being there at the Chancellor Hotel and just spending all my time bumping into people. It's just the weirdest feeling when you're in the middle of Arkansas and people just say, hey, Prem John. And it's like, wow, I'm home. Somebody asked me, where is home? Where is home? And I think people have different definitions of home. And I think one definition of home is where you can be the best version of yourself. And one of the places on the planet that I can be the best version of me is actually Arkansas. Another place is Cape Breton in Canada. Doug, you've been to Cape Breton. You'll know exactly what I mean. Uh, Cape Breton is a, just a stunningly beautiful place. And uh, it's just one definition of where is home. Uh, home is where you want to be the best version of you. So uh, that's that. So we have run out of time. Uh, we have gone over time. Thank you so, so much, everybody, for sharing your time with me. Time is the most valuable, valuable thing. Uh, money comes and goes, time doesn't. The only difference between rich people and poor people is rich people have more time. Uh, the only thing money can buy you is time. So therefore, when you do give me your time, I am so grateful. Uh, a big thank you to Yuji joining me from all the way in Dartmouth, uh, 100 yards or so from where I live. Martha, great to meet you on here. Megan. Best of luck. Pineapple Bliss sounds awesome. Really, really like it. Elizabeth, sorry if, I did, if you didn't like the answer I gave. Sorry, it was just, it's just something I just, uh, you know, when you get lots of data. You... It's, it, was, it was perfect. And I hate being a statistic. I wish more men 
would say that they experience imposter syndrome. They just don't Because say they it. do. <laughs> they just don't talk yeah. about it as much. Oh, yeah. oh um, so one of the things Adam Grant talks about this, and there's this great book, uh, there's this great, great book, uh, which I would highly, highly recommend. This is a great book. Why do so many many uh, so why do so many incompetent men become leaders and one of the interesting things the data does show that women are hired on competence men are hired on confidence so there's this big uh, there is the data to support the difference between competence and confidence so one of the ways we can deal with uh, that is by um, 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 just really improving our confidence by attending things like this so thank you so much, Megan. Good luck. Sandra, great to see you. Thank you so, so much. Hope all is well. Hope your daughters are well. Uh, and hopefully we'll meet up again very, very soon. Phil, always great. If I can help with the storytelling, uh, please, please, please feel free to. I do uh, organize something with Sarah Goforth, which is which is great. Don't tell her the joke that I always tell her. What do you call it? Uh, a Goforth without a PhD? Uh, Sarah? She doesn't find that joke funny. She does not find that joke funny. Doug, great to see you as always. Caleb, thank you. I'm in. Shukran uh, thank you very much, my friend. Thank you so much, mon ami. Merci. Uh, James, always good to see you. Lisa, next time. And David John Linden, thank you so much. Goodbye for now. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>